injured allies. We have seen images like this, crowds swarming the tarmac, some even clinging to aircraft as they taxi for takeoff. It happens as the Taliban takes over the country after U.S. troops recently pulled out from what is America's longest war. Leading our coverage in Kabul is NBC chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel. He's at the airport there. What is the situation, Richard? So, Lester, the arrival of tens of thousands of desperate Afghans who broke through security, climbed over the airport walls, slowed down the evacuation because U.S. flights weren't able to take off. They weren't able to land for fear of running over the Afghans who were trying to escape the country. But throughout the day, the U.S. military and the Taliban have been trying, not working together, but trying to accomplish the same goal, which is to clear off the runway, get those people out out so that those flights can resume. The Taliban wants U.S. troops out of here as well. And just a few moments ago, I heard a, uh, an American transport land. So that suggests that the United States and the Taliban were able to clear out the, the airport and get those Richard flights moving Engel, again. Thank you. Let's take you to the East Room of the White House. Here's the president. It's that have taken place in the last week, and the steps were taken to address the rapidly evolving events. My national security team and I have been closely monitoring the situation on the ground in Afghanistan and moving quickly to execute the plans we had put in place to respond to every constituency, including and contingency, including the rapid collapse we're seeing now. I'll speak more in a moment about the specific steps we're taking, but I want to remind everyone how we got here and what America's interests are in Afghanistan. We went to Afghanistan almost 20 years ago with clear goals. Get those who attacked us on September 11, 2001, and make sure al-Qaeda could not use Afghanistan as a base from which to attack us again. We did that. We severely degraded al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. We never gave up the hunt for Osama bin Laden, and we got him. That was a decade ago. Our mission in Afghanistan was never supposed to have been nation-building. It was never supposed to be creating a unified, centralized democracy. Our only vital national interest in Afghanistan remains today what it has always been, preventing a terrorist attack on America's homeland. I've argued for many years that our mission should be narrowly focused on counterterrorism, not counterinsurgency or nation-building. That's why I opposed the surge when it was proposed in 2009, when I was vice president. And that's why, as president, I'm adamant we focus on the threats we face today in 2021, not yesterday's threats. Today, the terrorist threat has metastasized well beyond Afghanistan. Al-Shabaab in Somalia, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Nusra in Syria, ISIS attempting to create a caliphate in Syria and Iraq and establishing affiliates in multiple countries in Africa and Asia. These threats warrant our attention and our resources. We conduct effective counterterrorism missions against terrorist groups in multiple countries where we don't have permanent military presence. If necessary, we'll do the same in Afghanistan. We've developed counterterrorism over the horizon capability that will allow us to keep our eyes firmly fixed on the direct threats to the United States in the region and act quickly and decisively if needed. When I came into office, I inherited a deal that President Trump negotiated with the Taliban. Under his agreement, U.S. forces would be out of Afghanistan by May 1, 2021 just a little over three months after I took office. U.S. forces had already drawn down during the Trump administration from roughly 15,500 American forces to 2,500 troops in country. And the Taliban was at its strongest militarily since 2001. The choice I had to make as your president was either to follow through on that agreement or be prepared to go back to fighting the Taliban in the middle of the spring fighting season. There would have been no ceasefire after May 1. 
There was no agreement protecting our forces after May 1. There was no status quo of stability without American casualties after May 1. There was only a cold reality of either following through on the agreement to withdraw our forces or escalating the conflict and sending thousands more American troops back into combat in Afghanistan, lurching into the third decade of conflict. I stand squarely behind my decision. After 20 years, I've learned the hard way that there was never a good time to withdraw U.S. forces. That's why we're still there. We were clear-eyed about the risks. We plan for every contingency, but I always promise the American people that I will be straight with you. The truth is, this did unfold more quickly than we had anticipated. So what's happened? Afghanistan political leaders gave up and fled the country. The Afghan military collapsed, sometime without trying to fight. If anything, the developments of the past week reinforced that ending U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan now was the right decision. American troops cannot and should not be fighting in a war and dying in a war that Afghan forces are not willing to fight for themselves. We spent over a trillion dollars. We trained and equipped an Afghan military force of some 300,000 strong, incredibly well-equipped, a force larger in size than the militaries of many of our NATO allies. We gave them every tool they could need. We paid their salaries, provided for the maintenance of their Air Force, something the Taliban doesn't have. Taliban does not have an Air Force. We provided close air support. <clears throat> We gave them every chance to determine their own future. We could not provide them was the will to fight for that future. There's some very brave and capable Afghan special forces units and soldiers. But if Afghanistan is unable to mount any real resistance to the Taliban now, there is no chance that one year, one more year, five more years, or 20 more years, the U.S. military boots in the ground would have made any difference. Here's what I believe to my core. It is wrong to order American troops to step up when Afghanistan's own armed forces would not. If the political leaders of Afghanistan were unable to come together for the good of their people, unable to negotiate for the future of their country, when the chips were down, they would never have done so while U.S. troops remained in Afghanistan, bearing the brunt of the fighting for them. And our true strategic competitors, China and Russia, would love nothing more than the United States to continue to funnel billions of dollars in resources and attention into stabilizing Afghanistan indefinitely. When I hosted President Ghani and Chairman Abdullah at the White House in June, and again when I spoke by phone to Ghani in July, we had very frank conversations. We talked about how Afghanistan should prepare to fight their civil wars after the U.S. military departed, to clean up the corruption in government so that the government could function for the Afghan people. We talked extensively about the need for Afghan leaders to unite politically. They failed to do any of that. I also urged them to engage in diplomacy, to seek a political settlement with the Taliban. This advice was flatly refused. Mr. Ghani insisted that the Afghan forces would fight, but obviously he was wrong. So I'm left again to ask of those who argue that we should stay. How many more generations of America's daughters and sons would you have me send to fight Afghans Afghanistan's civil war when Afghan troops will not? How many more lives 
American lives, is it worth? How many endless rows of headstones at Arlington National Cemetery? I'm clear on my answer. I will not repeat the mistakes we've made in the past. Mistake of staying and fighting indefinitely in a conflict that is not in the national interest of the United States, of doubling down on a civil war in a foreign country, of attempting to remake a country through the endless military deployments of U.S. forces. Those are the mistakes we cannot continue to repeat because we have significant vital interest in the world that we cannot afford to ignore. I also want to acknowledge how painful this is to so many of us. The scenes we're seeing in Afghanistan, they're gut-wrenching, particularly for our veterans, our diplomats, humanitarian workers, for anyone who has spent time on the ground working to support the Afghan people for those who have lost loved ones in Afghanistan, and for Americans who have fought and served in the country, serve our country in Afghanistan. This is deeply, deeply personal. It is for me as well. I've worked on these issues as long as anyone. I've been throughout Afghanistan during this war, while the war was going on, from Kabul to Kandahar to the Kunar Valley. I've traveled there on four different occasions. I met with the people. I've spoken to the leaders. I spent time with our troops. And I came to understand firsthand what was and was not possible in Afghanistan. So now we're focused on what is possible. We will continue to support the Afghan people. We will lead with our diplomacy, our international influence, and our humanitarian aid. We'll continue to push for regional diplomacy and engagement to prevent violence and instability. We'll continue to speak out for the basic rights of the Afghan people, of women and girls, just as we speak out all over the world. I've been clear the human rights must be the center of our foreign policy, not the periphery. But the way to do it is not through endless military deployments. It's with our diplomacy, our economic tools, and rallying the world to join us. Now, let me lay out the current mission in Afghanistan. I was asked to authorize, and I did, 6,000 U.S. troops to deploy to Afghanistan for the purpose of assisting in the departure of U.S. and allied civilian personnel from Afghanistan and to evacuate our Afghan allies and vulnerable Afghans to safety outside of Afghanistan. Our troops are working to secure the airfield and to ensure continued operation of both the civilian and military flights. We're taking over air traffic control. We have safely shut down our embassy and transferred our diplomats. Our, di our diplomatic presence is now consolidated at the airport as well. Over the coming days, we intend to transport out thousands of American citizens who have been living and working in Afghanistan. We'll also continue to support the safe departure of civilian personnel, the civilian personnel of our allies who are still serving in Afghanistan. Operation Allies Refugee, which I announced back in July, has already moved 2,000 Afghans who are eligible for special immigration visas and their families to the United States. In the coming days, the U.S. military will provide assistance to move, to move more SIV-eligible Afghans and their families out of Afghanistan. We're also expanding refugee access to cover other vulnerable Afghans who worked for our embassy. U.S. non-governmental agencies or uh, U.S. non-governmental organizations and Afghans who otherwise are at great risk and U.S. news agencies. I know there are concerns about why we did not begin evacuating Afghans civilians sooner. Part of the answer is some of the Afghans did not want to leave earlier, still hopeful for their country. And part of it because the Afghan government and its supporters discouraged us from organizing a mass exodus to avoid triggering, as they said, 
a crisis of confidence. American troops are performing this mission as professionally and as effectively as they always do, but it is not without risks. As we carry out this departure, we have made it clear to the Taliban, if they attack our personnel or disrupt our operation, the U.S. presence will be swift and the response will be swift and forceful. We will defend our people with devastating force if necessary. Our current military mission will be short in time, limited in both scope, and focused in its objectives. Get our people and our allies as safely as quickly as possible. And once we have completed this mission, we will conclude our military withdrawal. We will end America's longest war after 20 long years of bloodshed. The events we're seeing now are sadly proof that no amount of military force would ever deliver a stable, united, secure Afghanistan, as known in history as the graveyard of empires. What's happening now could just as easily happen five years ago or 15 years in the future. You have to be honest. Our mission in Afghanistan has taken many missteps, made many missteps over the past two decades. I'm now the fourth American president to preside over war in Afghanistan, two Democrats and two Republicans. I will not pass this responsibly on, responsibility on to a fifth president. I will not mislead the American people by claiming that just a little more time in Afghanistan will make all the difference nor will I shrink from my share of responsibility for where we are today and how we must move forward from here. I am President of the United States of America, and the buck stops with me. I'm deeply saddened by the facts we now face, but I do not regret my decision to end America's war fighting in Afghanistan and maintain a laser focus on our counterterrorism missions there and other parts of the world. Our mission to degrade the terrorist threat of al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and kill Osama bin Laden was a success. Our decades-long effort to overcome centuries of history and permanently change and remake Afghanistan was not, and I wrote and believed it never could be. I cannot and will not ask our troops to fight on endlessly. Another, in another country's civil war, taking casualties, suffering life-shattering injuries, leaving families broken by grief and loss. This is not in our national security interest. It is not what the American people want. It is not what our troops, who have sacrificed so much over the past two decades, deserve. I made a commitment to the American people when I ran for president that I would bring America's military involvement in Afghanistan to an end. While it's been hard and messy, and yes, far from perfect, I've honored that commitment. More importantly, I made a commitment to the brave men and women who serve this nation that I wasn't going to ask them to continue to risk their lives in a military action that should have ended long ago. Our leaders did that in Vietnam when I got here as a young man. I will not do it in Afghanistan. I know my decision will be criticized, but I would rather take all that criticism than pass this decision on to another president of the United States, yet another one, a fifth one, because it's the right one, it's the right decision for our people, the right one for our brave service members who risk their lives serving our nation. And it's the right one for America. Thank you. May God protect our troops, our diplomats, and all brave Americans serving in harm's way. <laughs> Mr. President, what do you make of the President Biden.
Biden taking, uh, taking no questions, resolute that there is no turning the clock back in Afghanistan, noting the scenes we have seen coming from the Kabul airport today have been gut-wrenching. He says it has saddened him. At the same time, he posed the question, uh, how many more generations would you have me send to a country not willing to fight for itself? I'm paraphrasing there again. These are some of the images earlier at the airport, people trying to scramble up jetways onto aircraft. As we reported a few minutes ago, some movement of aircraft now taking place at the Kabul airport. Let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell. Kelly, tell us into what led up to that address today. Well, so much pressure building on the president to make these remarks. And what we saw was a president defiant against his critics in both parties about his decision, doubling down on his call to withdraw U.S. troops, Good also afternoon. acknowledging that he did not and his advisors did not fully appreciate how quickly Afghanistan would fall to the Taliban. What the president did not do is explain why this has been such a devastating unfolding at the airport and what uh, he will do right now. Now, what he's talking about is supporting additional troops to free the Americans who are there as well as allies of the U.S. who have been at real risk. But he did not really address how this unfolding of chaos and crisis and fear is on his watch. He accepted full responsibility for that, but the president spent most of his time talking about the fact that this was a decision he believes is the right one over the sweep of time and standing behind that. There's the symmetry, the political symbolism, the emotional symbolism of exiting Afghanistan by the anniversary of 9-11. But in many ways, that's an arbitrary date, one that certainly is a bookend to the U.S. involvement there. There, but didn't take into account things like the facts on the ground, the season of fighting, this time of year being more active for the Taliban. For President Biden, there is real political pressure here, with voices across the political spectrum saying, even if he is right about his call as commander in chief to exit U.S. forces from this active war, that the handling of this period is something that will certainly be on his watch and something he will have to take credit for and take all of the slings and arrows that come with it. What happens now in the immediate future will be key. Can the U.S. get a handle on this? Can the president be judged on actions from this moment forward to deal with the urgent crisis on the ground? Lester? Kelly O'Donnell. Kelly, thank you. Chuck Todd is NBC's political director and moderator of Meet the Press. You know the president's been, uh, been uh, being questioned by both political sides. Uh, did he lay out a case that he can continue to use and defend? Well, look, I thought his best argument was the fact that, hey, look at how uh, the Afghan army wasn't ready. The Afghan people didn't want this. The nation-building argument is the best argument politically he can make. But I want to concur with what Kelly said, which was the big gap in his remarks was not explaining why this is hap why this is so chaotic yes he admitted that they they didn't expect this to unravel this fast they perhaps had too much um, too much faith in afghan leaders uh, spent a lot of time blaming the afghans by the way over the weekend the president put out a printed statement that was very tough and seemed to pass the buck to president trump saying president trump tied almost implying that president trump tied his hands what i thought was interesting here is he did not, while he said, he noted that it's his predecessor that negotiated with the Taliban, um, he also said this is proof that there was never a good time to draw down, essentially almost letting, admitting that whoever attempted a withdrawal, because this is, he needs to almost make this argument if he wants to, uh, if he wants to make the case that, hey, this was going to be chaotic no matter who did it, he almost said this, making the case that this is, this chaos was inevitable considering what we saw. Look, he is now um, up against sort of history at this point. Anything that emanates, you know, what happens? I think the next month here, Lester, is going to be horrendous for him, public relations-wise. This is going to be a propaganda tool on the 20th anniversary of 9-11 with al-Qaeda, with these prisoners being released, with the Taliban there. I think this is going to be a tough month. Um, the question is, is he right? Is he able to do counterterrorism without being in country. That's going to be the big test and the long-term test of whether he made the right call or not.
All right, Chuck, thanks. It's notable the president also sent a warning to the Taliban today about uh, any attacks on American or American interests during this period would be uh, would result in a swift American response. Let's go to NBC's chief foreign affairs correspondent, Andrea Mitchell. She is at the State Department. What's the thinking there tonight? Well, the State Department has been very defensive about why they were so slow to get those special visas for Afghan translators and others who had worked with the U.S. military. And that is a criticism that he has not really addressed. Bipartisan criticism, I should add, from Democratic members of Congress who have said that they passed legislation in July specifically to speed this up. And it's not just them, of course, it's the women, the girls who are left behind and don't even qualify for those special visas. So he hasn't really addressed the Afghan people while criticizing understandably the political leadership in Afghanistan and the Afghan military. Also, he said that the original mission to make sure that there could never be another 9-11, an attack on the homeland from this, uh, this country as this base for terror, and that that was accomplished 10 years ago with the killing of Osama bin Laden, and that that could still be accomplished from, quote, over the horizon, from outside the country. That is not the case, though. According to former CIA director John Brennan, uh, who was in a Democratic administration as well as working for Republicans and others who say you cannot accomplish from outside what you have lost by the withdrawal because once you close the Bagram Air Force Base which you know so well Lester you've lost the ground truth and that that is going to be far more difficult and that under the Taliban these terrorists could reform. Lester. Andrea thank you. Let's get to NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel who's on the ground in Kabul. Richard we talked to you a moment ago you said it sounds like planes are flying again. Are they in any danger from from ground fire from the Taliban. Uh, they are in danger, but uh, we've seen some harassing fire from the Taliban. It seems like mostly celebratory fire going up at the planes to uh, to, to annoy them, to, to show the Taliban uh, that they have strength. Uh, but we have not seen any kind of uh, rockets or anti-aircraft fire. Now, the Taliban has those kind of weapons. They could bring them in, uh, but they have not done that so far. And just over the last several minutes, uh, we've seen several or heard several jets come in. Uh, you might be able to hear one of them behind me right now. It's, it's quite faint, but they've been coming in at a very rapid clip. They land, uh, they're on the ground for a couple of minutes, and they take off. So it seems like the United States is now trying to make up for time that was lost uh, while the airport was overrun today with people trying to escape. The biggest thing that people here in Kabul are going to hear uh, is that President Biden said that human rights are the center of his administration. People today were trying to escape with their lives. They fear that the the U.S. or they believe that the U.S. has abandoned them, abandoned hope, abandoned women in this country, and they will say, "How could it possibly be?" Faced with the what we the scenes we saw at this airport just a few hours ago, that the president comes on national television and makes an address and says human rights are his the, the cornerstone of it of his policy. And Richard, from what you've seen, there is are the Taliban in in such numbers that this appears like an occupation, or is there is their appearance scattered throughout the city? Uh, they are trying to present themselves not as an occupation, but as the new government. And they are going around, in some cases, knocking on doors, trying to be friendly. They are smiling. They are driving around in their vehicles with the white Taliban flag. They are telling people not to be afraid. Uh, they are encouraging uh, Afghans, including Afghan translators, to stay and say that they won't be punished. Uh, whether they can be believed is, is another story. But, but right now, the, the Taliban is, is trying to bask in, in its victory. Uh, it says that what it achieved was uh, was was uh, was a gift from God that no one in the world could possibly have achieved, and, and they are uh, riding high at the moment. We will see where, if they are challenged, if people start to uh, disagree with their policies, how the Taliban will react. And then the final issue about terrorism. Uh, it's not just about territory. It's not just about being on the ground. It is the symbolic victory. Uh, Al Qaeda affiliates today have already already been celebrating the Taliban victory, that the Taliban was able to push the United States out of Afghanistan. And that is a significant thing, because first you had ISIS. ISIS was destroyed. Al-Qaeda was a, a diminished uh, shell of itself. But now, with this 
very public Taliban victory and the U.S. pulling out under fire and the evacuation flights uh, happening right now to try and get people out as quickly as possible. The, the, the international jihadi movement is, is now seeing itself reinvigorated and inspired. Okay, Richard Engel in Kabul, thank you. I spoke earlier with General David Petraeus, who's one of America's former military commanders in Afghanistan. Well, General Petraeus, let me begin by asking you point blank. Did the U.S. just lose the war in Afghanistan? Well, certainly the outcome, I think, is catastrophic. Uh, it's also heartbreaking. It's tragic. Um, and I do think there were alternative approaches, options that we, in fact, should have considered. I counseled those for many years. But we are where we are now. And I think what's most important at this moment in time is to realize that there are many that we have so far left behind, and we must do everything we can with all the resources available to us uh, to ensure that we meet the moral obligation to them. My conversation, part of my conversation with General Petraeus earlier, I want to bring in now Admiral James Stravides, who's NBC, uh, NBC's chief international security and diplomacy analyst. He previously served as NATO's supreme allied commander with responsibility for Afghanistan, and we're grateful uh, you're joining us today. Uh, can you give us a sense of the operation underway now at that airport in Kabul, how risky it is, how well prepared the U.S. is to carry out these kinds of missions? We're very well prepared, Lester, but don't underestimate the risk here. Um, the Biden administration is one C-17 crash, one firefight, one uh, bomb going off away from a, a, a disaster. And that's what concerns me, and I'm sure that's what's going to keep the president up at night for the next few weeks until, and, and hopefully, we can consummate the plan that he laid out. We've got to secure this perimeter. 6,000 troops ought to be able to do that. My guess is the Taliban who want to show Taliban 2.0 is kinder, gentler, listening to their better angels. I don't believe it. But for the moment, tactically, they want to demonstrate that. So it's in their interest as well. I think when you put all that together, the odds are better than even that we'll get through this over the next couple of weeks. Dave Petraeus, my good friend, is precisely correct. The tactical objective now is to get the Americans out, get our allies out, and get the Afghans who stood with us out. We have the capability to do that. Um, it's it's going to be challenging if something suddenly goes bang in the night. Let's hope this one comes off well. All right, Adam Stavridis, thank you very much for talking to us. And that concludes our coverage of President Biden's address to the nation on Afghanistan. We'll, of course, have much more tonight on NBC Nightly News as the story continues to unfold, including more of my interview with General David Petraeus. I'm Lester Holt, NBC News, New York. Good day, everyone. You're just watching an NBC News special report of the president addressing the situation in Afghanistan. So let's go right to NBCNews.com. Senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece, uh, who is outside the White House right now. Shannon, President Biden flying back from Camp David this afternoon to address the situation in Afghanistan from the White House. His first on-camera comments in nearly a week. He stood firm, saying he was the fourth American president to inherit this war and that he would not pass it on to a fifth. What else did he say about what we're seeing in Afghanistan this week? Uh, what most stood out to you? Well, he was clearly defiant yeah. and addressing head on the criticism that we have heard from the past few days from not just uh, Republicans, but Democrats as well. Uh, he placed the blame on this situation happening more quickly than expected on the Afghan military, on the Afghan government. Uh, he said that he would not send Americans to go fight in a conflict that the Afghans themselves weren't willing to fight in to shift the blame to the Afghans in this situation. He also defended his decision to pull troops out, saying that it was not in America's national security interest, that we went into Afghanistan uh, to address the threat of terrorism in that country. He said now that threat has changed. Now the threat of ISIS in Syria is a bigger threat. Now uh, Terrorist groups forming throughout Africa and the Middle East is where the focus needs to be. And saying we're not losing all attention on Afghanistan when it comes to counterterrorism, but that is not where uh, the United States' priority 
needs to be at this point. So really pushing back on some of his critics. It's unclear, though, if this is going to quell any of that criticism, because there were a number of things that he didn't address. And while there are people who have criticized his decision to pull out, there has also been a lot of criticism, particularly from members in his own party, about how the past few days were handled, why we were seeing American diplomats trapped at the airport, why thousands of Afghans haven't been able to get their visas processed, why we saw the uh, airport overrun with people clinging to airplanes as they were trying to leave the country. Those images and why that happened, the president didn't address head on. He did say that it was messy. It was far from perfect. Uh, and he did acknowledge that things happened. Uh, the, the, the Taliban moved into Kabul much more quickly than he had been anticipating. But regardless of what has unfolded over the past 72 hours, he said there has been no change, no wavering in his decision to pull U.S. troops out and that he has no regrets. Yeah, Shannon, the president also placing uh, some of the blame on the past administration as well, talking about the deal that he inherited uh, from the Trump administration. Uh, what else did he have to say on that? Yeah, that has been a line of argument yeah. we have heard from administration officials saying that under an agreement reached with the Trump administration, uh, the U.S. was supposed to leave by May and that of course, the Biden administration extended that to some point, but had the U.S. essentially you know, reneged on that deal or said we wanted to stay even longer, that would have caused the U.S. to have to send more troops in and re, uh, you know, restart a fight, a conflict with the Taliban so that this was the moment to leave, uh, that this was the time that they had to do it. And there essentially was no choice there unless we wanted to get back into a conflict with the Taliban. And of course, some could argue uh, that's the move they sh we should have made, but the president laying out this bigger belief that it is just no longer in America's national security interest to have a military presence in Afghanistan. And as you said, saying he does not regret his decision, uh, a defiant president there uh, defending the choice to leave Afghanistan before September 11th. A Shannon Petty piece at the White House, thank you so very much. All right, let's bring in NBC News political director and meet the press moderator, Chuck Todd. Chuck, great to have you with us today. Uh, the president saying, of course, he does not regret his decision, that this was not supposed to be nation building. As you watched him speak today, what was most compelling about what he said and what was missing? Look, the most compelling argument he made um, it was the fact that it's, in some ways, the reason this is going so poorly is the Afghan people didn't want to fight for their own country. How do we get involved in someone else's civil war? This was never supposed to be about nation building. Nation building, fighting in the Civil War, those were the two best long-term arguments. Those were the best arguments for withdrawal. Uh, that's not, though, part of the problem he's got to address here, right? The biggest hole in his argument, or in the speech, if you will, is he didn't really address why this is going so poorly, why it appeared that, you know, he, he for instance, he, he kept going back to the, well, look, we had to get out by May 1. Yeah. Um, and he said that the choice was either, you know, we stick to this agreement or we send more troops. Well, there was a there, there was a door number three. You know, uh, the biggest thing just just why do this during fighting season? Why not at least get the withdrawal done in the winter, where you know there's fewer Taliban fighters, if you will. It is not as violent, uh, and you might give the Afghan government a, a fighting chance, if you will, in their security forces. So. You know, the, just simply buying six months. Now, I've I've talked to folks in the administration. Mm -hmm. I talked to Secretary of State. Um, hey, and Chuck, I have to stop you there. I'm so sorry. We're going to have to go to the State Department. Back. There's a briefing with spokesperson Ned Price. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah. Let's listen in. Citizens shelter and not to travel to the airport until they hear otherwise from the Department of State. We also continue to pursue all options to relocate interested and qualified Afghan SIV applicants and their immediate families, as well as other vulnerable Afghans. We remain closely coordinated with our international partners on the ground and around the globe. We've been engaging tirelessly with our partner partners in the international community. Uh, you may have uh, seen last night, the United States organized a joint statement with 98 signatories calling on all parties to respect and facilitate the safe and orderly departure of foreign nationals and Afghans who wish to leave the country. Today, Secretary Blinken spoke with Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov 
uh, PRC uh, State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi, Pakistan Foreign Minister Qureshi, UK Foreign Secretary Rob, NATO Secretary General, General Stoltenberg, uh, Turkish Foreign Minister Chavasolu, and EU High Representative Joseph Borrell. Yesterday, he spoke with Australian Foreign Minister Payne, French Foreign Minister Ledrian, German Foreign Minister Moss, and Norwegian Foreign Min Minister Sarida. <laughs> Other senior officials have been making calls to their counterparts as well around the clock. Additionally, the UN Security Council issued a joint press statement earlier today calling for a new government that is united, inclusive, and representative, including with the full and, full and meaningful participation of women. The Council spoke with one voice to underscore that Afghanistan must abide by its international obligations, including to international humanitarian law, and ensure the safety and security of all Afghans and international citizens. The situation will continue to remain fluid in the coming hours and, and likely in the coming days. Nevertheless, we are operating on multiple fronts and around the clock to protect our people, those who have worked side by side with the United States over the years, and other vulnerable Afghans. Now, before I take your questions, I do want to speak to one additional issue that is of great importance to us, and that is the U.S. response to the earthquake in Haiti. The United States is closely monitoring uh, the situation following a magnitude 7.2 earthquake that struck south the southwestern part of the country on August 14th. We offer our deepest condolences to all who suffered the loss of loved ones or saw their homes or businesses destroyed. We are in close contact with Haitian authorities to respond to the earthquake and any requests for assistance. On Saturday, USA USAID deployed a disaster assistance response team, or a DART, to lead the U.S. government's humanitarian response efforts. And yesterday, at the request of the government of Haiti, USAID deployed members of Fairfax County Fire, uh, Fire Department's Urban Search and Rescue, USAR, uh, a team to join the DART. So far, the DART conducted an aerial assessment and is continuing to assess the damage. They will also identify priority needs and coordinate with the government of Haiti and humanitarian partners. U.S. Coast Guard uh, air crews are transporting medical personnel and supplies from uh, Port-au-Prince Port to Jeremy and Lakai, and are evacuate, evacuating injured citizens to higher level of care facilities in Port-au-Prince. At the request of USAID, Southcom is sending two UH-60 and two CH-47 helicopters from Joint Task Force Bravo to provide critical airlift support to ongoing relief efforts. We are also closely tracking Tropical Storm Grace, which is expected to reach Haiti today potentially exposing people to further devastation. The United States remains a close and enduring friend to the people of Haiti, and we will continue to provide assistance in the aftermath of this tragedy. We are committed to helping the Haitian people build a better future. With that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thanks. Uh, can I ask two real quick logistical ones, and I hope they're really hope they'll be real quick. Um, one, uh, other than the threat, I guess you could call it, to uh, respond uh, militarily, if the Taliban interfere or get in the way of any of the uh, evacuation efforts, um, do you ha is there any kind of agreement that's been reached or any kind of an arrangement that has been reached with them about the presence of um, the, the U.S. military at the airport, uh, or are they just basically there at, at kind of the, the pleasure of the Taliban, as it were, until they decide that they've had enough and they start? Uh, I don't know if they will or not, but whether they start to resist mm -hmm. the fact that the airport is not under their control. Well, let, let me take the opportunity to offer a bit of context on our diplomatic efforts over the past 72 or so hours. Uh, Ambassador Khalilzad and his team uh, remained in Doha. They still remain in Doha, uh, following consultations that we talked about last week with a number of countries from the region, the UN, uh, and countries much farther uh, a field. They continued, uh, and they still continue, uh, to engage with the Taliban. Uh, they continued to engage uh, with the Islamic Republic, that is to say, the government of Afghanistan representatives. Um, when it became clear that the government uh, of Afghanistan was on the verge of collapse, that President Ghani had fled, uh, and that the Taliban were encroaching on Kabul, uh, the focus, of course, uh, changed. Uh, it shifted from supporting uh, peace negotiations along with the international community uh, to working assiduously and All right, let's go over to the Department of Defense, the DOD, giving an update on the situation in Afghanistan. Operational details. More than 700 SIV applicants have departed Afghanistan in the past 48 hours, 
by a combination of contract and commercial error, bringing the total to date to nearly 2,000. Mr. Reed here, I will have more details on that. The U.S. military continues to support or supported the State Department with the closing of the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, moving hunt several hundred personnel uh, by helicopter to HKIA. Those personnel remain safe and are preparing to depart. Forces continue to conduct operations, security operations at HKIA, and as I said earlier, we are in charge of air traffic control, and that includes with commercial contracted military air. We expect to maximize our throughput of all means of transportation over the next coming days. Again, our focus right now is to maintain security at HKIA, to continue to expedite flight operations while safeguarding Americans and Afghan civilians. We're proud of the professionalism and the skill of the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines are showing under extraordinary circumstance at, H at HKIA and they are absolutely prepared to respond and self-defend if necessary. Many of us have spent time in Afghanistan over the years and feel a deep sense of connection to the current events. We are focused on the safest evacuation of Americans and Afghans. Thank you. Thank you, General. Thank you, John. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking time today. I'm Gary Reed. I'm the lead for the DOD Crisis Action Group for Afghanistan for matters pertaining to the relocation of refugees and transportation of our embassy staff, Americans, allies, and other partners from Kabul to their onward destinations. Secretary established the Crisis Action Group in early July, and we've been working very closely with the Department of State as a lead agency since that time. Uh, partnered with Department of Homeland Security, our initial focus was to relocate the SIVs, uh, finalize their visas, and resettle them into the United States with the help of our non-governmental organizations. To date, nearly 2,000 Afghans have passed through this process, joining more than 70,000 that have participated in the SIV program since 2005. Our military has done an outstanding job supporting this effort. U.S. NORTHCOM and U.S. Army North, operating predominantly from Fort Lee, Virginia, have provided housing, food, medical treatment, medical screening, and other services to these Afghans. Our military embraced the opportunity to recognize their contributions to combined operations in Afghanistan by welcoming, welcoming them in the U.S. As we prepare for even more arrivals, U.S. NORTHCOM and the U.S. Army are working to create additional capacity to support refugee relocation in the U.S., including temporary sites under assessment at Fort Bliss, Texas, and Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. There may be other sites identified if services are needed, additional capacity is needed. At this point, we're looking to establish 20, 22,000 spaces. Uh, we can expand if we need to. As with the operation we've been supporting at Fort Lee, persons that come to these locations will have been pre-screened by the Department of Homeland Security to enter on condition of full immigration processing once they arrive. With this operation underway, but given the urgency of the situation in Kabul, our focus has shifted to supporting movement of our embassy staff, American citizens, allies, and other partners out of Kabul. Starting on, the August, on August 14th, we began movement of these persons on Department of Defense aircraft, providing them transportation that had flown into Kabul delivering our troops and hauling cargo. This is an important point. Um, the numbers to date are in the hundreds. We certainly have a much greater requirement. We are still in the process of bringing in forces. These aircraft, as space is available on the outbound, have been taking passengers. And of course, this has been somewhat disrupted uh, in the last 24 hours. But nonetheless, we have transported several hundred to countries in the region and align them, again, with our State Department and DHS colleagues for their onward transportation. We anticipate picking up the pace, provided we can stabilize conditions at Kabul, as described by the general. Our military team in Kabul is working side by side with the ambassador and his staff to coordinate future airlift operations in the coming days. 
the Department of State and Department of Homeland Security will facilitate initial processing at overseas transit points and prepare for onward movement for all of those transported by the Department of Defense. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll uh, get to questions. Uh, Bob, can I go? Thanks. Right, so a question for General Taylor. Okay. Uh, General, has the U.S. military conducted any airstrikes today or in the last 24 hours or so? And also, there have been some reports of Afghan pilots um, flying their aircraft into other countries. Um, is that happening? And is the U.S. taking any other sort of steps to prevent aircraft or other military equipment from falling into the hands of the Taliban? Yeah. First on the uh, first question on the strikes. Um, no, no strikes have been conducted in the last uh, 24 hours, but uh, the commander on the ground continues uh, to maintain that capability if required uh, to do so. Uh, the commander has the assets uh, that are available uh, there at HKI and in support uh, from other areas of, of the region. Um, I, I don't have information on the uh, your second part of the question, uh, but uh, we'll get back to them. Uh, so there's no no U.S. actions being taken to prevent equipment from falling into the hands of the Taliban by destroying it or anything else? I don't have the, the answer to that question. You don't have the answer? Um, General yeah. Taylor, was this a failure of intelligence or planning that led to the scenes we saw at the airport today? When the, the scenes at the airport of the everybody Obviously coming caused on to it the, to be shut down. Yeah, what uh, what we know had happened at the uh, the airport was that there were a lot of Afghans that uh, were trying to uh, reported get out of the country. Uh, so I don't think that was a, a lack of planning. As we look at the coordination uh, with those that were responsible uh, for securing that, uh, we'll look at our mission. Though, as I talked earlier, is now that the airfield's open. Uh, is to make sure that it remains open uh, so, like, uh, as I said, we can continue uh, expediting flights in and outbound. But the quick fall of Kabul, was that a failure of intelligence? No, I, I can't answer that. And, Mr. Reed, um, you're in charge of the SIVs. There are women who fought for um, the special forces. Um, there are reports that the Taliban are now knocking on doors, going into the homes of those who served in the military. What are you doing to protect them, to get them out? Are you in touch with the Taliban, and do you have assurances that they'll be safe? We recognize that beyond the SIVs, there's additional Afghans at risk, and they are included within the group of people that, uh, in, t in time, as we get through the Americans and the, initial, the immediate priority, uh, that we have plans in place to support uh, lifting them, uh, remove. Uh, transporting them out of the country on the defense side. Again, it would be uh, Department of State, Homeland Security, questions about immigration processing. We recognize the risk that they face, and we're doing everything we can to get this operation underway at scale so we can get through as many as possible uh, under, under these very difficult conditions. But are you communicating with the Taliban? Do you have a line of communication? I'm personally not communicating with the Taliban, but uh, I would imagine there are communications within the diplomatic channels. As we said earlier, Gen uh, General McKenzie did meet uh, in Doha with Taliban leaders. Uh, I'm not going to detail that conversation, as I s said earlier, uh, but the message was very clearly put to the Taliban uh, that these operations and our people were not to be attacked or there would be a response. And as you and I speak, there has been no uh, attack on our operation or on our people at the airport. To your other question, uh, I would, again, like to just fill out that the mission that the military has right now is to secure the airport, to keep operations going, uh, and to help make sure that we can safeguard the movement of personnel, people, uh, uh, from Kabul to onward destinations. That's the focus right now. Uh, the State Department has uh, methods of their own to reach out to people, uh, to communicate with them about, uh, about the process of of getting into the queue, and I would let the State Department speak to that. But it's, uh, as I said before, the military mission is very narrowly focused around the airport, making sure we can secure operations there. Barb. Uh, I'd like to follow up with you or the general, but let me start with you, please, at the mic, if I may. To follow up on the previous question, the U.S. military, the Department of Defense, always, for decades, says we plan for everything. Clearly, whatever you planned for did not get planned for at the airport. We've now seen a C-17 with more than 600 people sitting on the floor with a pilot making the decision 
that he would fly them out anyhow, even though that's an extraordinary number of people. We've seen the world has seen all the scenes at the airport. So my two questions are, what failed in your planning? Because you didn't plan for this. You would not have planned to fly in such dangerous circumstances. And how do you determine where the responsibility lies for this failure? Well, first of all, Barbara, I would take issue with uh, uh, your designation of this uh, operation at the airport as a failure. But let's get back to that in a second. Well, Let, uh, let's get back to that in a second. Yes, we do plan for all manner of contingencies. This is a planning organization. Um, and we do that specifically to try to mitigate risk uh, and to try to be ready for unforeseen circumstances. But it's not a perfect process. Plans are not always perfectly predictive. And you, uh, and as is a well-known military maxim that plans don't often survive first contact, uh, and you have to adjust in real time. And I think uh, when you look at the images uh, out of Kabul, uh, that would have been difficult for anybody to predict. Yes, we, we did plan on uh, uh, non-combatant evacuation operations as far back as May. There were drills being done here at the Pentagon uh, to walk through what different non-combatant evacuation operations might look like. There was another one recently done just two weeks ago, uh, a tabletop exercise, to again examine what a non-combatant evacuation would look like out of uh, the Hamid Karzai International Airport, I mean, specifically at the airport. Uh, and we think that those exercises did prepare us in terms of having the resources forward, the secretary forward deployed uh, troops, including Marines, off of their ship and into Kuwait so that they could be more readily available, as well as other forces in the region. Uh, so we, a, a lot of what you're seeing transpire. The reason we can be so quick uh, with upwards of 6,000 troops is because we anticipated the possible need to do this. Now, could we have predicted every single scenario and, uh, and, and, and every single breach around the perimeter of the airport with only a couple of thousand uh, troops on the ground? Absolutely. You know, there are, there are changes that happen. Uh, so plans are terrific, and we take them seriously, but they are not and, and never have been perfectly predictive. When you practiced this, was one of the scenarios a complete Taliban takeover uh, of the capital? There, there was certainly, uh, as you do exercises, I don't want to go into too much detail here on these, but, uh, but uh, it would certainly be wrong to conclude that the United States military did not view as a distinct possibility uh, that the, the Taliban uh, could overrun the country and, uh, and including Kabul. Now, as we've talked about here many times, uh, it happened very fast. Um, and one of the things that we couldn't anticipate and didn't anticipate was the degree to which uh, Afghan forces capitulated, sometimes without a fight. But the president said that when he did not see that happening. Did you tell the president that you thought it was a possibility the country would be over? We won't speak to advice and counsel that uh, our leaders here in the Pentagon give to the president. What I can tell you is that in, in the in the planning that we've done and in the in the exercises and drills we ran, we certainly ran them against the possibility uh, that the Taliban would make significant gains throughout the country. Yes, absolutely. Carla. Um, speaking of the images we've been seeing at the airport, uh, a U.S. official has told VOA that there's an investigation currently underway about multiple civilian deaths when a C-17 took off from the airport. What more can you tell us about that investigation, and can you confirm the number I, of deaths? I can't confirm that reporting, Carla. So, I mean, you're, you're getting information that I don't have, but it wouldn't surprise me in the least that uh, commanders would be uh, taking a look at uh, what happened this morning with respect to the C-17, and I won't get ahead of that process. There will be—you can expect that we will take a look at this uh, to see what happened uh, and what we can learn from it in the future. That is absolutely consistent, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if there was, in fact, a formal investigation, but I just can't confirm that right now. Looking at the images, um, was the U.S. too late to bring in the number of troops that it brought in? Was the decision—did the decision come too late? We flowed these forces in as fast as we possibly could, and it was aided, in fact, by the by the pre-positioning that was done uh, in previous weeks. Uh, I mean, you all reported yourselves about the Iwo Jima, the the Navy ship 
from which these Marines were based, you know, being extended for a couple of weeks by Secretary Austin. That was a decision he made several weeks ago uh, because it was all part of the contingency planning for the need to maybe uh, do some evacuations. To f make that even faster, we moved those Marines ashore, uh, and we saw the benefit now. The, those, those Marines uh, were the first ones on scene. So uh, you, you, we, it was something that we absolutely had, had thought about. And one last question, and this can be for you or the general. You have spoke from the podium over the last several days many times saying that the, the Afghan Air Force was conducting more airstrikes against the Taliban than the U.S. was. My question is, why was that? Why didn't the U.S. conduct more strikes against the Taliban in these final days? Yeah, Carla, I think, um, uh, you know, Monday morning quarterback in here now, I mean, it isn't, uh, I don't think, a helpful exercise. But um, the, as we said from a while ago, that uh, as our resources and capabilities in the region dwindled because of the drawdown, and we were ordered to draw down by the end of August. And we were nothing but honest about the speed with which we had to do that, because speed is safety. We wanted to make sure we did this quickly. Uh, and a drawdown means a drawdown. And it's not just about boots on the ground. The drawdown is about capabilities and resources in the region as we wrapped up uh, our advise and assist and combat missions in Afghanistan, which meant we had fewer airplanes, fewer strike capabilities in the region as we continued to draw down. And again, we were very transparent about the fact that we would conduct airstrikes in support of the Afghans where and when feasible fully cognizant of the fact that it wasn't always going to be feasible in every, in, on every day uh, and in every place. But the, the Afghan Air Force is indigenous, and they are in the country, uh, and they did maintain their presence. And, and there were days where they flew easily twice as many strikes as, as we did, uh, and they were able to often get on scene uh, quicker because they were already there and because they had tangible connections to their troops in the field. It, it also is a, a healthy reminder, something that I think we forget, that in the last year and a half, uh, Afghans were in the lead of, the, of almost all, um, literally all, but just about almost all, uh, of their operations uh, uh, on the ground. I mean, they, the advise and assist mission was still there, but they were very much in the lead of their own operations and coordinating with their Air Force. So, um, I have a question for Mr. Reed. Okay. Um, you said earlier that um, your crisis ac action group uh, for Afghanistan was set up, was set up in uh, uh, early July. That's right. um, the decision of uh, President Biden to end uh, the war was taken in um, mid-April. Why did it take so long to create a group to take care of your Afghan allies? The Department of Defense enters into this in support of the State Department. And the State Department has, for many years, as you know, executed the SIV program. Um, the addition of the U.S. military support to that program was new, and it was generated by guidance to try to accelerate and help the process due to the time delays inherent within getting them through. So we were asked. Uh, by the State Department to provide support to their operation. That's not a suggestion that that is when SIVs became a priority for the government. That has been for many years. It was just the contributions that the Defense Department could make, using our installations in the United States as an example, where we could do this in a very orderly setting, uh, free of distractions, without them coming individually or scattering to multiple locations. We could centralize the resources and contribute our resources, our logistics, our, our medical personnel. Fort Lee, Virginia is the center of excellence for Army logistics. So it was a good example of how we could use our resources to support a program that we all wanted to see continue and accelerate and, and help as many folks out as we could, uh, because, you know, we value what they did for us, and we want to be uh, reciprocal in that regard. So do we have to understand that this uh, group was created because of the slowness of the process uh, at the State Department? No, that's not what I said. It, it is a long process. And to the extent that the addition of DOD resources and support could make it, again, about bringing them all together. If you're familiar with the process, there's multiple stages and multiple agencies involved within our system. This gave us, because of our resources, the ability to have a base with a location. We could bring that together and speed up something that may have otherwise taken weeks into a matter of days. 
and it became more economical. We ex increase the throughput of that process and create capacity to do more. So that's really the contributions of the Defense Department. I think we need to get to the phones too a little bit. I haven't done that yet. Uh, Dan Lamoth, the uh, Washington Post. Thank you, John. Uh, to, to drill down a bit on, on the on the flights out that we've we've seen on video, um, my colleagues at Defense One have reported there were in excess of 600, perhaps 640 people on a C-17 flying out. Uh, and you you also took a question this morning in your first briefing and said you'd try to get back to us on it. There appeared to be two people that fell from that aircraft, likely to their death. Can you confirm those things? Thank you. Uh, on the uh, on the that video footage that I know we've all seen of uh, of something falling off, off the wing, I, I don't have uh, an update for you in terms of uh, specific validity of that. We're obviously uh, just as interested in you and in, in learning more about uh, what what happened there. Um, and on the on the first question about the 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 C-17 with you know fully loaded, I, again, I don't have any additional information about that particular aircraft and that particular flight, uh, but uh, but you know we'll we'll continue to try to dig down and uh, and see if there's more information that can be had about that. It's obviously uh, difficult from 8,000 miles away to to uh, to have perfect knowledge about everything that's going on on the ground over there. Uh, but again, uh, we're working hard to secure uh, to keep the airport. Uh, secure and uh, keep these operations now uh, sustained now that they're they're back on track. Nazira. Thank you so much, John. As you know, I'm from Afghanistan, and I'm, I'm very upset today because Afghan women didn't expect that overnight all the Taliban came. They took off my flag. This is my flag. And they put their flag. Everybody is uh, upset, especially women. And I forgot my question to me. What do you ask? Where is my president, former President Ghani? People expected that he bye bye with the people and immediately he ran away. We don't know where is he and we don't have a president. President Biden said that President Ghani no. He has to fight uh, for us people. They have to do everything and we were able to uh, financially help them. But we don't have any president. We don't have anything. Afghan people, they don't know what to do. A woman has a lot of achievement in Afghanistan. I had a lot of achievement. I, I left from the Taliban like 20 years ago. Now give, we go back to the first step again. Do you have any comment? We are our president. You should answer to Afghan people. Well, I obviously can't speak for uh, Ashraf Ghani or where he is or what his views are. I wouldn't do that. Um, but let me say with all respect that uh, that I understand and we all understand the the anxiety and the fear and the pain that you're feeling it's it's clear and it's evident and uh, nobody here at the Pentagon is uh, happy about the images that uh, we've seen uh, coming out uh, in the last few days uh, and we're all mindful of um, of the kind of governance governance that the the Taliban is capable of um, uh, so you know, heart heartfelt uh, respect to, to what you're going through. And, and we, uh, we understand that. Um, a, a lot of us have spent time in Afghanistan. The general mentioned that um, everything that you're seeing in the last 48, 72 hours is personal for everybody here at the Pentagon. Uh, we, we too have invested greatly in, in Afghanistan and in the progress that women and girls uh, have made politically, economically, socially, uh, and and we certainly uh, do understand and we do feel uh, the pain that that you're feeling, probably not to the same uh, extent. Uh, we uh, we're focused right now on making sure uh, that uh, that we do the best we can for those Afghans who helped us. And to Sylvie's point, uh, uh, when she was talking to, to Gary, yes, the action group got stood up in July, but you can go back to the spring and and, and hear the secretary himself talk about uh, interpreters and translators and the sacred obligation that we know that we have to them. And so in this moment, on this day, now that the airport is open again, we are going to be focused on doing what we can to honor that obligation to all those who, uh, who help make all that progress possible, because, because by helping us, they helped us help you. 
uh, and and uh, we take that very very seriously. And again, I'm I'm sorry for your pain. I, I truly truly am, and I know that uh, the general and Gary share that uh, as well. Megan. Uh, Mr. Reed has said that you guys want to make space for 22,000 Afghans, other helpers, to be able to come to the U.S. There's about two weeks until all troops are supposed to be off of the ground in Afghanistan. Who is going to protect that mission into September, assuming that 22,000 people are not going to get out in the next two weeks? And does that mean that there might be an extension of some of these security forces at the airport after that? Well, I can't speak to the last part, but I can say that our commitment and the secretary's task to me is to continue to do everything we can in this department to support this process. And as conditions change and, and opportunities change, we will do our very best to make whatever resources this department has to contribute uh, to continued uh, success in that regard. Understanding it could be very difficult. We don't know what's ahead, but we're going to stay in this as long as it takes, as long as we can contribute. And I would just add, Megan, uh, it's up to 22. That's the capacity that we're looking at at, three, at these three installations. Um, it doesn't mean that there are going to be 22,000 people that need that support. We're just trying to find, fill out the capacity as best we think we need right now. If, if we have underestimated that capacity, the secretary is fully committed to finding additional locations and installations if we need it. Um, and if we've overestimated, then to Barbara's excellent point, we've planned well. We've, uh, you know, we've we we want to make sure we're we're ready. So it's it's a capacity thing of up to 22. We're not being predictive that it's going to actually be 22,000. So is that to say it's as many people who can get out in the next two weeks, or is there a consideration? What I can tell you is that over the next two weeks, we're going to uh, be as aggressive as we can and moving as many people as we can. And as you've heard me say, once we get uh, the operation uh, up and running well here, we could get conceivably up to 5,000 out a day. But it's that's that's seats on airplanes, not just military airplanes, but commercial and charter air airplanes as well. That doesn't necessarily mean that there will be that demand signal on the other end. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Let me go back to the phones here. I haven't been good about this. Uh, uh, Tara, cop. Um, thank you for doing this. Um, we just reported on the C-17, a separate C-17 that was able to airlift 640 Afghans out and learned that that was one of several C-17s that have that number or more aboard. Um, so I was just wondering, how is the Pentagon or State Department tracking just how many Afghans and Americans it's helping assist depart the country? and uh, how how going forward are you able to track those people to be able to help them as they repatriate elsewhere? So the uh, the number of seven hundred that I gave earlier was the number reported by uh, Department of State and the the commander on the ground. So the question uh, as we continue to go forward, uh, that is one of the more important uh, tasks that we will do is as Department of State continues to provide names of those that will depart. Uh, the military will continue to ensure we have uh, the aircraft, whether it's military uh, or civilian aircraft, to get them out and continue to report uh, forward. David. This is a lot like Megan's question. What is the determining factor here? Is it August 31st, or is it the completion of the mission to evacuate diplomats, U.S. citizens, vulnerable Afghans. It's uh, the the mission is to uh, evacuate uh, our embassy personnel, uh, uh, American citizens, uh, as well as Afghans who we can help. That's the mission set. The time frame that we're on right now is to is to is to do that, complete that mission by August thirty first, and. If we're at 5,000, and, and I've seen some estimates that go north of 5,000 a day, depending on how many sorties you can fly, and obviously that's dependent on a lot of factors, including weather, um, uh, we believe that th there, with that capacity, should air operations be able to go uninterrupted, uh, that we can meet those, we can meet that goal uh, by the end of the month. Beyond. August 31st, it's just too difficult to speculate, and we wouldn't want to get ahead of, uh, of decisions that haven't been made yet. 
where our head head is right down right now on getting the air operations going again, getting uh, getting airplanes in with troops and getting people on those same airplanes as they head out. And, and then once the troop flow is done, uh, to be continued to, to continue to flow in uh, military aircraft uh, empty to pick up uh, people and go out. But again, uh, our focus is on getting as much done as we can as quickly as we can. Uh, and yes, the date August 31st is uh, is when the, the president has told us to be done this drawdown and this movement. Uh, I won't speculate about what it's going to look like beyond that. Are there any plans for helping people get to the airport? Right now, as I said before, uh, our mission, military mission, is to secure the airport, uh, to safeguard uh, air traffic and, and people and, and the flow uh, at the airport. And that's, that's what we're focused on right now. Courtney. General Taylor, can you tell us a little bit more? Uh, Kirby said that there hadn't been any Taliban attacks, but there were a couple of security incidents earlier in the day. Were those Taliban, who, the, these armed fighters that the U.S. hit? No. We can't confirm that those uh, were Taliban. Uh, we do know that there was uh, some random shooting that uh, came in during that piece, but not confirmed uh, to be Taliban. Have there been any other security incidents like that? Have there been any Americans wounded? Uh, there haven't been any other major security incidents that, other than what we saw last night. Uh, there was a report of uh, one U.S. Uh, wounded, but uh, superficial and already back to duty. Shot? Was the individual shot? I, I don't know that detail. And then was he, wounded. And then can you—I'm not sure who this is for, but I, I'm still unclear on the numbers. So there have been 700—since—let's take it from August 14th until right now. Yep. There have been 700 SIV— Candidates, how many Americans have been moved? How many aircraft have left taking people out? Like, how many total people have been moved as part of this evacuation operation so far? Um, out of the country? Yeah, so I can give you the answer uh, for the, the SIV. So, in the last 48, uh, we know that we had 700 uh, out on flights. That gives us that total of 2,000 SIVs uh, since. Uh, we began operations. But how many Americans? I mean, haven't there been Americans moved out on the em who worked at the embassy, right? There, and other Afghans who are not SIV candidates as well? Have there been? I'm trying to get a sense of you know, this has been ongoing for 48 hours. And it, it, I hate to say it, but have you only moved 700 total people in 48 hours? In well, so first thing, just to remind everyone, the SIVs that we're talking about were on the charter flights that the State Department had chartered. And we have been running those since the um, 29th of July. We, I think, 10. Flight 10 arrived overnight last night, 265. Uh, none of them went to Fort Lee. They already had their electronic visas, and they're being processed by state. The outflow of Americans and embassy staff, is it's in the, the hundreds. I don't have an exact number for you, but just to reinforce, this is sort of available space on aircraft that are coming in configured, not ideal to just load up completely. There's equipment backhauls and other things that are occurring on these aircraft. So think of it as a space available with those aircraft going out. And as Mr. Kirby said, as soon as we get all the forces in, you will have aircraft coming in solely for ramping of these evacuations, getting up to the uh, 20 or 30 a day, getting you up to 5,000 per day. So, but as of now, it's still in the hundreds of people who, as part of this evacuation mission, in the hundreds that's that have I'm been trying. now. Yeah, that's right. And we talked about that earlier Thank today. You. We got time for just a couple more guys, Mike. Uh, can you tell how we're, the U.S. is going to keep Afghanistan from becoming another terrorist safe haven? Since arguably we're in a worse position than we were uh, pre 9/11. We've talked about this too, Mike. I mean, we have uh, robust uh, over the horizon counterterrorism capabilities already in the region. Uh, 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 we can fly from. Uh, ships at sea. We can fly from bases in the region. Uh, I mean, just in terms of the uh, support we were able to give uh, to the Afghans uh, in just the, the, the airstrikes that we did in support of them, I mean, there were multiple sorties uh, per day, uh, and, uh, and sometimes several strikes, sometimes as many as 10 to a dozen uh, per day. Uh, so we've got the capability and, and the capacity. And we continue we to talk. We continue to talk to partners in the region to see if we can explore additional options that are closer to Afghanistan. But you've heard the secretary say this uh, many times. There's not a scrap of the earth that we can't hit if uh, if we don't need to. Now, um, is it more difficult uh, to do uh, counterterrorism strikes over the horizon? You bet. Um, you, uh, do you have to travel more distances? Yep. 
Could it take more time? Yes. But it's not like we haven't done this before. And if you look at, uh, if you look at other places around the world uh, we, where we execute over the horizon counterterrorism, it is possible, it is effective. Um, and we believe that uh, our intelligence apparatus um, and uh, the networks we have in the region now are far more mature than they were in 2001. Uh, and uh, we believe that we can execute effective over the horizon counterterrorism capabilities going forward. Doesn't mean that we aren't going to try to improve that. Uh, we absolutely will. I got just time for uh, one more. I'll go to Tony. Yeah, for General Taylor, I want to go back to the question, though, that the, the Afghan National Security Forces collapsed quicker than anticipated. What was anticipated? I ask you because you've been there. You, had, you said you had a deep emotional connection to the events on the ground. Roughly $83 billion has been spent. 66,000 of these brave people have been killed, according to the CIGAR. Can you give a sense broadly why do you think they seem to have collapsed quicker than expected? I think, uh, as Mr. Kirby said earlier and others, is that uh, the, the anticipation of uh, the lack, possibly, of action by the, some of the Afghan leaders, I think, is uh, the, one of the areas uh, that we look, are continuing uh, to look at. When you say Afghan leaders, you're talking military Mil or political leaders? Military uh, and, and some of the political. But really, as we look at what were the actions or lack of actions at the, the military level uh, throughout the country is what we're looking at right now. Because eighty-three billion dollars, people are going to say that was wasted. I mean, what do you think? What do you what do you respond to somebody who does not follow you closely? Yeah. Uh, I know that we will continue to look to to find out and, and dig deep into uh, the why uh, we're at where we are today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. We got to get going. Appreciate it. All right, you've been listening to the Pentagon update on the situation in Afghanistan. Joining me now, NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs. Uh, Colonel Jack, uh, uh, questions for the Department of Defense today about why the U.S. didn't take military action, airstrikes to slow down the Taliban in some way. Could you explain for our viewers who might have similar questions what the U.S. military strategy has really been in Afghanistan in the last week, uh, in the last 48 hours, and your take on how the Biden administration's handled this Taliban takeover? Well, I think the administration and the military establishment were both caught.